The high-profile Brexiteer Jacob Rees-Mogg has told this programme that he has no need to come to the border region to understand how Brexit will affect the people who live there. The Tory MP spoke to me in London yesterday and made clear he believes there will not be a hard border once the UK leaves the European Union. As you know better than I do, there is already a border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. There is a border for immigration rules, for currency, for VAT and for excise. There's also probably some smuggling over that border in all reality. Uh, but that is not a border that has men in peaked caps manning it or barriers to enforce it. It is enforced remotely from the border. When we leave the European Union, there will be other aspects of this. There will be regulatory divergence and there will be customs issues. Those, once again, do not need to be policed at the border. And I think you need to look at the border as a tax point rather than as a checkpoint. And then there is no reason for physical infrastructure. As the head of HMRC has said, he sees no need uh, for physical infrastructure at the border. Uh, the Chief Constable of the PSNI, George Hamilton, who, who knows the border well, obviously, has said he fears a fortified frontier that would have to be policed around the clock would put his officers' lives in greater danger from anti-peace process paramilitaries. His voice, surely, is a voice worth heeding. But that's a very important conditional that you have brought into this discussion, that what he said is that uh, a border manned 24 hours with physical infrastructure could create a risk. But the British government is not proposing that. There is no need for that. But Michelle Barnier has made it very clear if the UK leaves the customs union and the single market, that will mean border checks. Well, again, what do you mean by checks? The checks don't need to take place at the border. They need to take place on the goods once they have passed through. But the other issue that this rises, raises is that is the EU going to insist that the Republic of Ireland implements a physical 24-hour manned border structure along the border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland? This seems to me to be fanciful that the relevant governments, the British government, the Irish government uh, and the European Union, all three have said that they do not want physical infrastructure at the border. If all three don't want it, who is going to do it? So when Lady Herman said in the Commons recently, if we've no deal, we will inevitably have a hard border, we will see the return of violence in Northern Ireland. The former Conservative Chairman Lord Patton warned against a return to old feuds in Northern Ireland last week. He said if you've any checks on a border, they become the focus for violence. Now, he's got great experience in Northern Ireland. These are people who have thought about this. These are people who think potentially there are problems down the track. Lord Patton, who was all in favour of democracy for the people of Hong Kong, doesn't like democracy when it applies to the people of the United Kingdom who voted for Brexit, which he is doing everything he possibly can to frustrate. He's ignoring the fact that there already is a border and there are already controls and there are already investigations if things are smuggled for excise purposes. This is not done physically at the border with border infrastructure. So you think technology is the answer, do you? But what I'm saying is that it's the continuation of what is already there with some marginal differences. But and it's this much is more complicated. I it's mean, not respect, much more complicated. You're just, you're just wishing away no, 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 the potential difficulties this that isn't true. may become a reality. This isn't true. It isn't much more complicated. It's, in fact, just as straightforward. Because if we have any form of free trade agreement, uh, then there are no customs duties to be imposed and there will be um, regulatory recognition, not alignment, not the same standards, but a recognition that each side regulates to a satisfactory degree. This is absolute scaremongering and it's a really dangerous type of scaremongering actually because it is raising the spectre of a return to violence to achieve a short-term political goal. OK, let me ask you this question. To, to what extent does the border on the island of Ireland post-Brexit figure in your thinking at the moment? It's a very important part of the current discussion. But more important is getting the overall deal, because within the overall deal, the issue relating to the uh, Northern Ireland border uh, will be part of the bigger trade picture. And I think it's probably been a mistake to try and deal with this outside the trade deal, because as you keep on coming back to in your questions, until you know the trade deal, you all can raise the questions about what will the trade deal need to go with it. And I'm saying that whatever the trade deal is, we will not need to have a hard border. 
and you're saying, but you don't know what the trade deal is. Once you do know the trade deal, it's much easier to settle once and for all uh, the Irish border question. So the Irish government is very clear, as you will know very well, uh, that it believes there will be real difficulties potentially after Brexit on the border. Are you saying that those concerns expressed by Simon Coveney and Leo Varadkar are false concerns? Um, I'm saying let them impose a border if that's what they want to do. That would be a matter for the Irish government. It's not for me to make policy well, for the Irish, the Irish government. government. It would be the European Union, of course, well, because the, the Irish government is one of 27. If the European Union forces the Irish government to impose a border, that's a matter for the Irish government. They would be the ones who had to do it. And would you be fairly relaxed about that? That's a matter for the Irish government. No, but what would your feeling be as a Westminster MP to see a hard border imposed on people in Northern Ireland? I think Ireland? it's exceptionally unlikely that the Irish government would choose to do that. But you can't decide. Once we've left, we can't tell the European Union how to govern itself. Can we I ask you, left. Okay, when did you last visit Northern Ireland to discuss this issue? I haven't been recently. Have you been to Northern I've Ireland? I've been, but not recently. Right, so you haven't recently made any effort to visit the border? Well, there was a um, visit of the European, um, exiting the European Union committee, but I don't think that my going to the border would give me any greater insight than speaking to people. But it might do. If you, if you were talking to people who live on the border, whose businesses well, I've work spoken, across the border, they may I, I, I mean, I've you. certainly spoken to people from Northern Ireland who deal with the border, but I don't think... Like, 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 like who? Well, p people who are um, Irish MPs, um, Northern Irish MPs in the House of Commons talk to me about what's going on at the... Well, ten of them are members of the DEP and they yes. support Brexit, so well, they're hardly yeah. going to tell you anything that you haven't heard before. Well, Sylvia United, Herman, have you spent much time talking well, I to speak, her? I haven't she spoke, takes a very different... Look, I, know, I, know, I know Lady Herman, I've spoken to her, but I don't think my visiting the border is really going to uh, give me a fundamental insight into the border beyond what one can get by studying it. But your critics might wonder if you really understand the complexity of the border. If you haven't been there, if you have David Davis was there recently. Yeah, I know David Davis was there. I've spoken to David we Davis. We discovered he was there after he'd left, of course. Uh, but he was there because he felt it was important for him but to I talk to people I, I, and to see the border. I don't think this is a relevant point. That. The issue is one about do you need physical infrastructure in relation to what is going to happen? And the answer is no, you don't. That's the question. My going and wandering across a few roads isn't going to tell me anything about that further. You refuse to accept that there is a potential issue and you don't think, there is no issue you don't think it's worth your while becoming any better informed or exposing I've, I've, yourself I've, I've to the views of others who take I've, a different view. I've spent a lot of time discussing this issue with various people including discussing it with you this afternoon. I don't think an actual visit is going to be particularly relevant. Well, what you this. haven't heard, I suppose my point is this, Jacob, you haven't heard the views of people who differ from your perspective. I mean, we're having a conversation, but I'm not trying to persuade of course you I've heard, of a position. Of course I've heard views of people who differ from me. They've been put forward in countless forums. They've been put forward at the Brexit Select Committee. We've had people come in and give evidence to us. I've listened to lots of views on this. Of course I have. And none of them have persuaded you whatsoever that there may be a point. This is a voluntary act. How you police your border is a decision for a sovereign state. If a sovereign state says we will leave this border open, the border is open. So either the UK government or the Irish government has to decide that it wants to implement a hard border. Both governments have said that they do not wish to. So who is going to do this? That is the question that nobody has managed to ask. It's some sort of phantom government that is going to do this. OK, so look, the Prime Minister said very clearly there can be no hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic, yes. no hard border between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, and no customs union between the UK and the EU. You are telling me that those three things can be achieved? Yes. You can square that circle? It's not a circle that needs squared. It's a clear circle. It's very straightforward. You don't think there's a challenge said. there? I mean, Michel Barnier has made it very clear. He, he can't square that circle. Michel Barnier is negotiating to try and keep the uh, United Kingdom as close to the European Union as possible. Well, last December, and I was in Brussels for it, we had uh, an agreement between Theresa May and the European Union on the backstop arrangement. When we yes. got into 2018, the UK government couldn't agree with the EU's interpretation of a legal definition of that. So again, there was something that people like yourself said was very straightforward, and it has proven to be anything but. Uh, no, I didn't say that text was very straightforward. 
Well, no, you said the issue. Is no, the issue is very straightforward. But that text isn't very straightforward. But, but that, the, fact, uh, that the, fact, the fact that the that negotiations the haven't way. resolved the issue no, proves that, surely that no, this is you're, an issue you're, which is you're far ignoring from the earlier part of that text, um, the agreement signed in December, which is that nothing's agreed until everything's degree, agreed, and that we are in the midst of a negotiation of which the Northern Irish border is a very important part. It is inevitably being used by participants in this to maximise their leverage. Do you still take Theresa May at her word when she says the UK is leaving the customs union and the single market? Of course I do. Because she's now pushing within Cabinet, of course, her idea for a customs partnership, which you don't like. Uh, no, I agree with Boris Johnson. The customs partnership is crazy and it wouldn't take us out of the customs union or the single market. So the Foreign Secretary, a very senior member of the Cabinet, has criticised the Prime Minister for he her crazy yeah, idea. He, You've he, called he, it cretinous. He's criticised the customs partnership. The customs partnership was not proceeded with at the last uh, meeting. Governments discuss ideas. Not every idea that a government comes up with then becomes formal policy. The Prime Minister put in her manifesto last year that we would leave the customs union and the single market. That is the basis on which she is Prime Minister and I expect her to fulfil what she promised to do. That the customs partnership was a discussion and it has become clear that it cannot fulfil those, those um, requirements, those promises, and therefore it is a discussion that will come to an end. You say that uh, that's the basis on which she is the Prime Minister. Does that carry with it a veiled threat that if she moves from that position, she would not have legitimacy in that position as far as Jacob Rees-Mogg is concerned? Would you move to oppose her, uh, to remove her at that point? I completely trust the Prime Minister to stick to what she said. Why should I invent a hypothetical circumstance? But it's not really hypothetical yes, because she's now putting forward no, the no, idea no. of a customs partnership. No, no, the customs partnership has been part of a discussion. It's perfectly reasonable to discuss ideas and then when you discover that they don't meet your objectives to drop them. The government has to be free to discuss innovative ideas, not all of which will work. That's mm -hmm. part of the policy process. But it's her process. idea and she's the Prime Minister and she's not letting go. It's an idea that has come up through the system. Um, Theresa May did not sit down a year ago and think, oh, I'll devise a customs partnership. There is a system that comes up with yeah, ideas. There is, a policy, the there is a policy-making unit. Uh, it is an idea that she has had some sympathy for, but it's now become clear that it's unworkable and doesn't meet the commitments that she made. But it hasn't become clear to her that it's unworkable because it's still on the table. It's still up for discussion. It, it, it seems to be increasingly clear that it's not working, as Does far it? as I can tell. As far as I well, can if you, tell. If you read the papers today, there's a suggestion she's about to take it away from the cabinet uh, subcommittee to the full cabinet, where she thinks it uh, may get support. Time will tell, and it may be clear. And if she does that, I'm not going to say what will happen if the Prime Minister does something that would be entirely out of character. Why are you the not Prime going Minister, to say? Why are you because, not because I trust the Prime Minister. But the truth the is, Minister. she may do that, and then you, no, Jacob no, Rees-Mogg, no, have a no, very no. difficult decision to make. No, do you back her, no, no, no. or do you sack her? There, there are some things that become so absurd, so far-fetched, that they're not worth considering. Why is that absurd and far-fetched? That's the, the policy Minister, that the Prime Minister is pursuing at the moment. Before it became clear that it didn't meet the requirements of taking us out of the customs union, out of the single market. That only became clear very recently as people studied the proposal more carefully. The Prime Minister's great quality is that she sticks to what she does. She is a lady of firm principle and honour. It is inconceivable that she would uh, renege on the manifesto pledges she gave a year ago. So I wonder, do you think it is possible that you could be uh putting yourself before the electorate in Somerset sooner, perhaps, than you had expected if uh, these issues within the Conservative Party around legacy, around Brexit and around other things uh, come to a head. That is a real possibility, is it not? Well, since the Fixed Term Parliament Act came in, it's much harder that you require either a two-thirds majority of MPs voting uh, for a new election or the government to lose a vote of confidence. I think it's highly unlikely two-thirds of MPs would vote for a new election and there's no prospect of the government losing a vote of confidence. So it's unlikely. Nothing is ever impossible. And I didn't think we'd have the election that we had last year. And then I thought the Conservatives would win by a majority of hundreds. So my punditry skills aren't necessarily the best. You're not right about everything all the time. Sadly not, no. I, I, I leave infallibility to the Pope. Uh, interesting to hear your thoughts. Jacob Rees-Mogg, thank you very much indeed. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Quite a sign-off from the Brexit poster boy. So what do our commentators, Professor Deirdre Heenan and Newton Emerson, make of that stout defence of leaving the EU? Welcome to you both, Deirdre. Uh, he doesn't claim papal infallibility anyway. 
No, but he's a man who's clearly on secondment from the 18th century. And he's a very good example of uh, the cocoon that ardent Brexiteers are living in. He knows nothing about the Irish border. He has no interest in well, it. Well, you just don't agree with him. Well, no, he's simply saying there is no problem. But clearly there is a problem. He doesn't even acknowledge there is a problem. So if he doesn't understand the problem, I can't think how he's going to come up with a solution. He's simply saying it isn't going to happen. The man is living in denial, living in some sort of deluded dreamland that post-Brexit we will go back to a grand imperial Britain. Yes, he's an eccentric. I think that's part of his shtick to give those sort of statements in the way that he does. But it is also worrying his lack of detail and his lack of understanding about the issues around the border in Ireland and people's real concerns. Yes, he doesn't have to come and visit it and look at it and say, oh, there's an invisible border. But I think he does have a duty to understand and acknowledge what the issues are. Do you, do you think that um, Jacob Rees-Mogg visiting the border would be of any benefit to him or anyone else? Well, it couldn't do any harm, although I think it is overstated. These, uh, the, these stunts where people come and, and stare at a field um, I mean, I think that he is, he is correct in a sense that the, there won't be a hard border if it is politically impossible, if it can't happen. I think that's because it will be in Belfast Harbour. Uh, but uh, I mean, it, it, it is, it is a, a politics of the art of the possible. If it's not possible to have a border there, there won't be one. But, but his, his, his comments, says, you know, his, if there is a hard border, that will be because the Irish government has put one there. Is he right? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I don't think so on that front either. I mean, interestingly, what he says is very much what Bertie Ahern has been saying over the past few months, which is that a blind eye will be turned to the border. Uh, there'll be, uh, you know, licensing schemes and, uh, and essentially, you know, uh, it will be fudged and the Irish government won't put one up either. But on, the, on the customs partnership, I think an important point to make is that while it's not workable on the EU scale, Leo Varadkar again this week has signalled that he would be prepared to operate one with Britain and Ireland. So that's and, possible and too. Deirdre, the, the other interesting thing, we need to talk about legacy in a second, but the other interesting thing is that he says he trusts the Prime Minister, she is a woman of her word, he, he, he admires the Prime Minister, but he's called her policy cretinous and crazy. He's entirely disingenuous and has been plotting from the back benches, and we know that. And he said that she was weak and feeble, feeble when she was talking about uh, EU and talking to the EU. So I, I don't buy any of that, that she's strong and stable. Of course he's being disingenuous. I think really though when he is talking about the Irish border and he is the person that's put forward the technology solutions. Well, he can't come up with any. He's saying on the one hand there'll be no infrastructure, there'll be no cameras, and at the same time supporting views. He's not of, the only one who said that, of course. Well, of course. Far from it. Well, of course, but he, he hasn't actually been closely questioned as to what that means, what that would look like. He dismissed the security uh, implications that you put to him okay. and simply didn't have any answers. In fact, I don't think he had any answers in that interview for anything that was good.